Can you shoot pictures with a full frame camera and make them look like medium format? I'm gonna show you how to do it on today's episode of Ask David Bergman. Hey everybody, welcome back. Here I am, as always, answering your photography questions. Don't forget to go to AskDavidBergman.com. You can ask your photo questions there for the show. I'm also doing one-on-one -on -one workshops. You can check that out as well on the site. Also, if you're not already a subscriber to the Adorama YouTube channel, make sure to go ahead and click that button down below. Use the little bell to get notifications as I'm recording this. We are so close, just a couple thousand subscribers short of one million. We can't thank you enough for all the support you've shown us over the years. We're gonna keep providing this great free photo content for you, myself, and a bunch of other photo hosts. So please come back every week and check us out. Spread the word and put us over a million. All right, let's move on to this week's question. It's a really good one from Jesse B and it is, how can I mimic the look of medium format with a full frame or crop sensor camera? All right, medium format. What are we talking about when we refer to medium format? Well, most cameras that we're using today are based on the old 35 millimeter film size. So the sensor in the camera, when we say full frame, we're talking about it's the same size, 24 by 36 millimeters. That's the same size as an old 35 millimeter piece of film. There are also crop sensor cameras that are smaller than that, but it's still that general idea. When we refer to medium format, we're talking about something like this. This is an old Hasselblad 500 CM camera that I play around with every once in a while. It's a really old camera from the 60s. I've got a newer digital uh, back on here, but if I take this off, you can actually see where the film would go. That, that space, that square hole there is actually 60 by 60 millimeters, right? So that's a lot larger than a full frame sensor. So it's going to give us, when we shoot onto that, whether it's digital or film, it's going to give us a different look than that 35 millimeter film full frame camera. So what is it that makes the look different? Well, a lot of people like to say that it actually changes the depth of field that you get with wider lenses. You get a much shallower depth of field when you're shooting with a larger sensor camera. Now that's kind of true and kind of not. I've done other videos debunking the whole uh, uh, lens uh, focal length changing the field of view or sensor uh, size changing the depth of field, right? So. Um, that actually isn't the sensor that changes the look of the background. But what happens is because you're shooting the same focal length on a larger sensor, you actually, to get the same field of view, so if you wanted to frame your subject the exact same way, you'd have to move in closer. So when you move in closer, that is actually what's gonna throw your background more out of focus. So even though it seems like medium format has a shallower depth of field, it really doesn't, but the net result of having to move in closer to get that same look, that same field of view, will throw that background, that bouquet, the uh, the aesthetic quality of the background, it's gonna throw that more out of focus. Now again, I'll put links to all the videos below I've done about all the differences and how that's changed, but specifically when we're talking about medium format, let's take a look at this example. So. Right now, the video that I'm shooting, I'm using an 85 millimeter lens at 1.4. It's an, the Canon 85 1.4, my favorite portrait lens. And um, I have a really shallow depth of field at 1.4. You can see the background. It's going uh, pretty much out of, you know, pretty out of focus. And it's a nice aesthetic quality that I like. But um, what happens is now, if I, the camera is maybe 12, 15 feet away from me. If I take that camera and move it in a lot closer, right? And this is what the still image would look like like from that from that view obviously you can see that background is more out of focus right it's even more out of focus because the camera is much closer the distance between me and the background hasn't changed but the relationship from the camera to me and the camera to the background has changed so it's more out of focus and that's a really cool look but obviously you can see there's a different field of view it's a much tighter image, right? So I don't, I wouldn't want to shoot it that way because it's obviously much too tight. I'd rather have the same look as if I was using a medium format camera and backed up. So what I can do to make it look more like that medium format image is I can actually shoot more images around that field of view and create a panorama, right? Stitch those images together to make a wider sensor, basically, right? By shooting multiple images overlapping. It, and it, it is gonna change the look of that, that 
uh, background, right? Because I'm gonna have that wider field of view, but still have that really cool out of focus background. Now, there's an interesting method that he does exactly this called the Brenizer method. It's a photographer, Ryan Brenizer. He sort of brought this old school uh, um, technique back into the lexicon about 10 years ago. Other people call it a bokeh panorama. And it's exactly that. It's shooting, you're taking your, uh, your subject first usually so that you can, because you're gonna be overlapping images, you don't want any movement, right? So you're gonna take the subject first and then do the images around it to fill that in. Now, I did a video about this, again, a two minute tip video a few years ago. I'll post that below as well. But there's a couple things to be aware of. First of all, you wanna lock all your settings. You wanna make, you don't want your focus to change. You want to be manual focus because if you're, as you move the camera around, if the focus changes, if it uh, focuses on the background, when you stitch that together, you want this to look like one single image. You don't want the background to be in focus, especially for one frame of that panorama. So make sure you lock that. Your exposure needs to be locked in so it doesn't change. White balance, if you're shooting raw, you're okay uh, leaving it on auto white balance because you're gonna change that when you convert them anyway. But again, what you wanna do is have your subject stay relatively still. And again, the, the technique that Ryan uses is to shoot the subject first and get that out of the way. Now, there are other ways to do it, right? So I wanted to try to see if I could do this here by myself. I'm here in my home office in New York City, and I wanted to figure out how I could demonstrate this technique without, you know, needing other people, right? So here's the thing. I, years ago, was known for using what's called the Gigapan. Now, the Gigapan is a um, piece of hardware that you put your camera in that allows you to shoot these overlapping images in a grid pattern, right? It automates the movement so that it makes it really easy to stitch or easier to stitch in post. So I became known for this, this uh, technology. In 2009, I photographed President Obama's first inauguration. There were two million people there. And I made an image that was 20 uh, images across and 11 down and stitched them together to make this really high res panorama. And then the net result is it's so high resolution, you can zoom in and you can see pretty much every face in that crowd of two million people. So that thing got 30 million views, it went really crazy. But, um, but I've you know used that Technology. I've taken that gigaband to the Olympics and the Super Bowls and uh, with, used it with commercial clients, and it really is a cool way to make these panoramas. So I wanted to try it here and do a self-portrait bokeh panorama, right? So, um, so I pulled out the gigapan, and what I did was I took it a little bit earlier today, and instead of having it where the camera is right now, I moved it in closer where I made that other image that I showed you before, and I photographed five images across and four down, and you can see how this works. You can see the video of it automatically moving. I'm staying as still as I can, and as those images are shot, as long as nothing moves, they should be really easy to stitch. Now, I set a 30% overlap. You wanna have a good amount of overlap so that you can, um, the software is gonna have enough meat to, uh, to stitch together, right? It needs to see where that overlap is. So, uh, but once you have those images, then you can go ahead and bring them into the computer. Now, again, I shoot everything raw. So when you do the conversions, I brought them all into Capture One. And when you do the conversions, you wanna make sure to have the same settings on all of them. So if you adjust exposure or color or anything like that, make sure you copy and paste those to all your images. And then with stitching software, you wanna bring those final images that you've exported, JPEGs in this case, into your stitching software. There are a bunch of them. The simplest one is built into Photoshop. It's called Photo Merge. It works pretty well. It's an automated merge, so um, you really don't have too much control. It does have trouble sometimes with images that are very out of focus because it can't find where that overlap is. So it's good with you know nice, solid, in-focus images, but it has a little tougher time with that. So if that doesn't do a good job with something like this, you're gonna use some dedicated panoramic software. I like one called PT GUI, P-T-G-U-I. Um, um, it gives me a lot more control, allows me to set control points, to lay out a grid, whatever it is I need to do uh, to get those images in the right place and stitch them together. There are other pieces of software, you can Google them to stitch any kind of panorama. Gigapan actually makes their own stitcher software. It is, I will warn you, pretty old. I think it was last developed in 2013, so I wouldn't really recommend it anymore, even though their hardware is outstanding. There are other ones called Auto Stitch. Microsoft makes one, makes one called Ice, that's Windows only. Um, 
but you just have to figure out which one works best for your particular image. I've only got 20 images here. PT GUI handles it really, really well. And you can see when I put them together, what that looks like. I've got this really wide image. Now, by the way, you always want to shoot a lot wider than you think you're going to need because you can always crop in and make sure you fill in all those spaces. You don't want to have any gaps in the images. Otherwise, you're going to have to crop that out or you're going to have to do some Photoshop magic to try to fill that in. So it's better to not have to do that. And then once you have that image with that really cool out of focus background, I mean, I think this image really has more, it's more out of focus than even a medium format, but I wanted to push it and really see how far I could make it. It's almost like a tilt shift, uh, you know, medium format, almost large format uh, image, right? So. Then finally, if I want to just play with it a little bit and make it give it that medium format uh, smell, I'm going to use it into, I'm going to put it into the DxO software, which is formerly the NIC suite. Um, they, DxO bought it and they, they've done really great things with it. It's a great suite of software. They make Silver FX Pro, which is by far the best uh, black and white conversion software you can buy. It's got, it looks really filmic. They also make Color Effects Pro, HDR Effects Pro, and then Analog Effects Pro, I think is great for this to finish it off. It's a, it's this, um, they have a whole bunch of presets of these different, different classic and vintage camera looks. And then you can go in, you can make changes. You can add in like a fake medium format border if you want. You can add light leaks, all kinds of things. Let me address uh, as far as trying to make an out of focus background with software. It is something you can do if you'd rather just do it in software. However, I don't think it's ever going to look the same, right? Because the thing is, you can blur the whole background. First of all, you have to select your subject really carefully. It's hard to do and make it look natural. You can blur the background, but it pretty much blurs it evenly. And the way optics really work is that the further away from the subject you get, the more out of focus it's going to get. Software is getting better to replicate that look, but still nothing, at least as of today, compares to when you can do it optically. So plus, it's just a fun thing to try. So go out there, give this a chance, use it, you know, do the Brenizer method where you shoot it manually or pick up something like a Gigapan, a good panoramic head and, uh, and have it done automated, uh, you know, in an automated way. It's really cool and it can be fun to play around with. You could even at the end of the day, crop that image that I made into a square, make it look like a Hasselblad image. You'll never know the difference. <laughs> of course you will, but it was fun to do anyway. Anyway, thanks so much for joining me. Remember, go to AskDavidBergman.com. That was a great question, Jesse. I appreciate you sending that in. I can help you one-on-one -on -one over over Zoom and Adorama TV. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment below. We love the back and forth, so we appreciate the support. Thanks for being here. I am back here every Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern with a new show. I'll see you back here next week on Ask David Bergman.